Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Soul 21, be singing. Yes. yes, yes. Thank you, Soul 21. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, good afternoon. Celebration Spiritual Center. It's so good to be here with all of you. I have a few things to share. I'll do my very best to, to move quickly. We've, we've had a, a, a lot of things happening in service today, um, but I do want to share this thought with you. So we are in our series, The Inside Joke. And last week we started with the topic, okay, I'm not playing. And the inside joke that we talked about was in the inside joke that, or belief that suffering and loss are the will of God. The truth statement comes from Ernest Holmes, as we read in The Science of Mind last week. The entire problem of limitation, evil, suffering, and uncertainty is not God-ordained, but is the result of ignorance. And so we talked about uh, moving from that place of ignorance, that place of not knowing, to a place of knowing, and then we talked to ourselves in our camera phones. We had a selfie conversation and said, okay, I'm not playing. So this week, I was thinking about something, I'm sure many of you know this, and, and maybe some of you don't, that um, it appears that uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z uh, are students of A Course in Miracles. Now, of course, A Course in Miracles is one of the texts that we focus on here at CSC, and, and shout out to those who are in 50 Days to Fearless Living right now with Pastor Yolanda or those who have taken the class, uh, and of course, we we teach and have been teaching over the last six years um, from this text along with others. Um, but, and I say it appears that they are students of A Course in Miracles because of two things. Now, in uh, on Beyonce's album Lemonade and the, the song All Night, she references a line from A Course in Miracles. Um, further, we have Jay-Z who actually references um, the same line from A Course in Miracles twice um, in his song with Pusha T, uh, Drug Dealers Anonymous, Lord have mercy. He references um, uh, the, the intro uh, to A Course in Miracles, or really the summary of A Course in Miracles. And then again, in a tweet, when um, Tidal reached one million subscribers, he used the same line. It was actually the preamble to his tweet. Um, and what is that? I'm not going to read the whole introduction to A Course in Miracles, but I want to focus on right what they both quoted. Um, and in the introduction to A Course in Miracles, we read this. This course can be therefore, uh, there can therefore be summed up very simply in this way. Nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. And so in Beyonce's song All Night, um, and it's interesting for those of you who know the, the trajectory of Lemonade, and of course it's, you know, there was some sort of infidelity and, and there were the issues, and then you move to the forgiveness part. Um, and so actually once she's moving to that place of forgiveness and reconciliation, this is where she then speaks A Course in Miracles, which makes sense if we understand A Course in Miracles and the teaching on forgiveness. And so there's, she actually says nothing real can be threatened in that song. Later, Jay-Z um, in both cases actually says the whole thing. Nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. Now. Again, I say it appears, because I don't know to what extent that they really understand the full meaning of the statement, the way that it's used, particularly in the case of the song with Beyonce, um, the idea is nothing real can be threatened. In other words, our relationship is real, so none of these outside people can threaten it, right? Um, and similarly, Jay-Z seems to be using it in that same way that um, you know people spoke negatively about Tidal and didn't think Tidal would be successful, but we now have our million subscriber. So my idea was real and it couldn't be threatened, right? That's how he was using it. And unfortunately, that's not what the course was talking about. <laughs> but as we hear this phrase, nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal, uh, exists. Herein lies the peace of God. It's a challenging statement, right? And it's a challenging statement for a couple reasons, because when we say nothing real can be threatened, I, I was hearing in my mind's ear all of the, the ways that we talk about and hear um, uh, talked about how um, uh, threats, right? We um, hear that um, uh, either our president and certain people that are related or 
connected to him are a threat to our democracy. Um, we hear and sometimes people will say this person is a threat to our safety or my safety or a threat to my peace. Um, furthermore, when we look at what's happening right here in the news, and, and I'm not going to say any anything else about this, but particularly the debates around Michael Jackson right now in the Leaving Neverland documentary. People are saying they're destroying the legacy of a genius, right? That they are tearing down our people, right? Threats, right? All of these things are threats. And so the thing about it, and the reason why A Course in Miracles is so clear that nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists, herein lies the peace of God, because when we perceive someone or something as a threat, we automatically become defensive. And so what does that look like? Well, one of the things in this country, it looks like the US military industrial complex. There's this beautiful conversation right now about the Green New Deal, and the retort is, how are you gonna pay for it? But nobody ever says that when, when, when there's supposedly a threat to our safety or a threat to our peace or a threat to our democracy, nobody says, how are you going to pay for it? After 9-11, how are you going to pay for it wasn't in the conversation. It was something terrible happened. We need to protect ourselves and retaliate. And so we'll just go in debt to pay for it <laughs> because it was seemingly that important, right? Now, that's on that level, but we can look at ourselves. We go to great lengths to secure our homes, to secure our cars, to secure our personal possessions, even now to secure our personal identity. There was just another big um, breach and, and lots of information you know, of millions of people has gotten out, right? We go to great lengths to protect all of these things. And then on a personal level, we put up walls, we put on masks and facades and relationships and at work and definitely on social media. Hello, somebody. When we feel that we can be threatened, we protect ourselves. We do all that we can to never feel or appear vulnerable. Am I talking to anybody in the room? And then ultimately, when push comes to shove, we attack. Now, what's interesting to me is that um, uh, there are two lessons that are really my favorite lessons in A Course in Miracles, and, and one we're gonna deal with today. A Course in Miracles in the workbook lessons calls defensiveness, a silly game a tired child might play. When we become defensive, this is what it's like. And, and I love this. I, I, I can think about the times um, when my daughter was young. And, and you know it, whether it's a family member or a friend, godchild, whatever it may be. You know that, time, that point when the kids start acting up and you know, it's like, oh, it's just time to take a nap. Right? right? They just start acting crazy. Just like, wait, where's your good sense? You just, I know you're, this is not who you are. Okay, come on, it's time, it's time to take a nap. And then they take a nap and what? They're back to their normal selves. They're fine. And so that's why I love this image that defensiveness, when we think we can be attacked, when we think that we're threatened, we're just like a child that is playing a silly game um, that just needs to go take a nap. So today we're going to give up childish games. And so as I begin to, to think about, and again, um, some of this is, is just prompted by things that I'm seeing and, and reading uh, on social media and all out in the world, there's a lot of defensiveness going on right now in so many different ways, so many different ways. And there's also a lot of attack. And so again, in my favorite lesson, lesson 153, it says, in my defenselessness, my safety lies. Defenselessness equals safety. Hmm. Hmm. Now, what does it say here in the, in the text or in the, in the text of the lesson? You who feel threatened by this changing world, its twists of fortune and its bitter jests, its brief relationships and all the gifts it merely lends to take away again, attend this lesson well. The world provides no safety. It is rooted in attack and all its gifts of seeming safety are illusory deceptions. It attacks and then attacks again. No peace of mind is possible where danger threatens thus. It makes sense, right? That the way things seem to be set up, the way things to be set up seem to be set up in the world, it, it's a couple things. One, it talks about the changing world, the twists in fortune and its bitter jests, right? It's brief relationships and all the gifts it merely lends to take away again. Uh, many times, this, this is what, how we surmise it and just say life isn't fair, 
right? Or life dealt me a bad set of cards, right? And so because of that, we kind of have this defensive and threatening relationship with life, right? The, the, we, we, we expect a rainy day, and, and, and so, you know, we're protecting ourselves against the rainy day, right? We um, uh, uh, don't think that we can uh, uh, keep the things that we have, so we do things to try to protect the things we have because we've seen over and over, we've seen the twists and turns of other people's lives and the fortune and misfortune of other people and the bitter jests of life and it's brief relationships and so we want to protect ourselves but many times in protecting ourselves we have to attack but once you attack it just becomes this cycle of attack and attack again so therefore no peace of mind is possible where danger threatens us if you feel you are in danger can you be or have peace of mind that's not possible right and we know that now it goes on and it says this Defenses are the costliest of all the prices which the ego would exact. You are its slave. You know not what you do in fear of it. You do not realize what you have done to sabotage the holy peace of God by your defensiveness. Defenses have a price. This is why, you know, uh, Gandhi famously said, right, an eye for an eye will leave the whole world blind. That's the wisdom behind that, right? You could be defensive, <laughs> you could attack, but then can't nobody see. Now what, right? And so to really, to really just get to the heart of this lesson, there are two specific lines in this lesson that just sums it all up. Defensiveness is weakness. Defenselessness is strength. And why does it say that? It says that because defensiveness is weakness because you're making an agreement that you can be threatened. You're making an agreement that you're weak, that you're a victim, and that you're powerless. But that's not the truth, right? Because it, it says here that you're sabotaging the holy peace of God. The holy peace of God is what's within you. And so further, in, if, if we look at the text, I'm in text chapter 31, um, section 9, for those of you who have the, um, the text, second paragraph. You always choose between your weakness and the strength of Christ in you. And what you choose is what you think is real. Lord have mercy. I was reading this this week and I texted Pastor Yolanda and, and we were texting each other like praise break gifts. Right? <laughs> you always choose between your weakness and the strength of Christ in you. And what you choose is what you think is real. This is so important because the question comes, well, why do we even do this? If all of this is true, why do we do that? Um, I love how Bishop Carlton Pearson says, I'm never interested in why a, why a person did something, when they did something that seems wrong. I'm interested in what were they thinking before they did the thing, right? And so what it's saying here is that we're always making a choice, consciously or unconsciously, between our perception of weakness or our understanding that the strength of Christ lives within us, and we choose what we think is real. Oh my goodness, Here, I, I, I'm just, I, I wanted to say that over and over again. We are only ever choosing what we think is real. And so this is where I think um, new thought and, and this philosophy that we teach and understand is important because I love the acronym for fear. Fear is false evidence appearing real. Whatever we think is real, that's what we choose from. But there is a strength within you. There is a Christ within you. There is a knowingness within you. There is a superpower within you that you always have the ability to choose from um, if and when you bring your mind um, to the reality that you're choosing between love or fear, between strength and weakness, between defensiveness and defenselessness. And in your defenselessness, your safety lies. Um, now, just in today's reading in 365 Science of Mind, I love this. Ernest Holmes writes, when we lift our thought above the confusion of the material world, we become aware of the spiritual cause behind all things. So as we are in this place of needing to make a decision, if we're in this place of feeling threatened, the opportunity for us is to rise above, lift our thoughts. This is why we use prayer. This is why we use other tools, which I'll talk about. We lift our thought above the confusion of the material world because your five senses are only giving you the smallest part of the picture. Right? Part of the problem is we've given so much power uh, to this external world. And so 
we give so much power to the good of this external world, and we give even more power to the not good of this external world. What we need to, to move into this place of, of understanding is that all of it is neutral, and all of it is changeable, and all of it comes from your thoughts. So I'm not going to get overly excited about the good, and I'm not going to get overly um, scared about the seemingly bad, because I recognize that all of it is temporary. All of it is change, changeable, and as the, the text says, as we just read, um, nothing... Uh, Nothing unreal exists. So I recognize that this idea of the good that I'm seeking at all times in my life, that's what's absolutely real at all times. So whatever's showing up out here, I don't let that move me out of my um, emotional state. And so we lift up our thought. We can lift up our thought through prayer. This is what affirmative prayer does. We lift up our thought above the confusion, and we know the truth, above the material world, and we become aware of the spiritual cause behind all things. And as I um, was thinking about that, this was supporting me. I, I, was, I love um, Ayanna Van Zant. something that she does. Um, she teaches all of her students. Um, shout out for anybody who's, who studied at InterVisions or who may be watching. One of the things that she does, um, she teaches her students to create acronyms around words um, to, to expand uh, your awareness about what that word is. So in the same way that I just use fear, false evidence appearing real, one of the ones that I love that she teaches is pain means pay attention inward now. So the thing is, you, when you feel that you're threatened and you want to go to a defensive place, you're going to feel some pain. You're going to feel some angst. Or when you're in a painful situation, that is an indicator. It's saying, pay attention inward now. It's saying you are at the crossroads of your weakness or the strength of Christ within you. And knowingly or unknowingly, you're going to choose one path, right? Because we always choose what we think is real. Now, we talk about daily spiritual practice not being an option, and we talk about being here in community. The thing is, as that, that wonderful Native American story tells us, whichever wolf you feed wins, right? So to the, the only way you're going to know that the Christ within you is real is if you're feeding that consciousness. The only way you're going to know that you have power beyond this external world is if you're feeding that consciousness. The only way you're going to know that you're word has power and you can speak truth and you can speak life into those things that seem dead, those things that seem frozen and fixed. The only way you're going to know that is to, is to be in community and in consciousness with this consciousness, right? To be in connection with this consciousness. And so this is the only reason we do this every Sunday. It's the reason why I come. Because I'm reinforcing this connection for myself, right? And the beautiful thing about it, and then you get to experiment. I talked about it last week, that idea that God is reasonable. Come, let us reason together. Oh, taste and see. Try it out. Right? Experiment with it. And this is also then why I love and why the work by Byron Katie is so helpful and why we teach it. It's so interesting to me, you, you know, we, 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 at CSC, we kind of, people talk about it often, you know, um, uh, we get messages and, and notes all the time. I've never heard a place that talks about Abraham, A Course in Miracles, and Byron Katie at the same time. Like, this is what I've been looking for, right? right? And that was deliberate. One, because th these, are, these are teachings that speak to us directly, and, and, and we feel that um, they're just so spot on for where we are in consciousness and where we are in, in the world right now. And so the work by Byron Katie is so critically important, again, which is why we teach it and why we use it and why we bring our minds back to it in classes and over and over and over again. Because many times when you're having a fearful thought, when you're having a defensive thought, when you're having a thought that would cause you to shut down or close up or put on a mask or put on a facade or you feel that you're scared of being vulnerable when you identify that thought the first question you is it true yes or no no him and hawing no explaining is it true and the thing about is it true it has to be true all the time 100% on every place of existence and so most of the time it's gonna be no but if we're really in our defensive place it's gonna feel like a yes, because that's what we think is real in that moment. See, this is, this is where we get to. In that moment, many times it feels like a yes. They shouldn't have done that. Is that true? Yeah, it's true. They shouldn't have done that. They shouldn't have said that. They shouldn't have acted like that. And so you're living in the yes of it in that moment because that's what you think is real. This is good information. But then we ask the second question, can you absolutely know it's true? Yes or no? 
No explanation. And, and what's interesting about this, these questions are designed to bring you back to your right mind, recognizing that you're standing at that fork in the road. You're standing there about to make a choice between your humanness or, you, or the truth that you're the spiritual being that is beyond this limited form, this per- temporary soul clothing that you have on, your perception of weakness, right? You have an opportunity to choose between that or the Christ, the strength, the power, the knowing, the consciousness within you. And so we ask these questions, can you absolutely know it's true? You might still say yes, and that's okay. Most of us probably get to know at that point, but then we ask the next question. I love this question, and and, uh, if you go back, we've done two series specifically on, on the work, and in that first series we did on the work, when we got to this next question, that sermon that I, I taught was how to get out of hell. And this question says, who, um, uh, uh, how do you, how do you, how do you treat yourself when you believe that thought? And, and to paraphrase, what I said in that message was simply, what does hell look like for you? Because when you believe that thought, you're creating hell. You're living in hell. You're, you're, you're not living in joy. You're not living in happiness. You're not living in the light. So describe hell for me. Because hell is not a real place. It's only a consciousness that we create through our thoughts. Similarly, heaven is not a real place. It's only a consciousness that we create through our thoughts, through our acceptance of the good that is. And so in that moment, how do you treat yourself? How do you talk to yourself? How do you treat others? What's your, what's your self-talk sound like when you believe that thought? Again, bringing, tr- seeking to bring you into your right mind because you're standing here at this fork in the road and you're going to make a choice, knowingly or unknowingly, but we want you to make a conscious choice. And so by asking that question, and then the fourth question, which is the heaven question, who would you be without that thought? It's the imagination step. Can you imagine what life would be like, how you would treat yourself, how you would talk about yourself, and how you would feel within yourself if that thought were not true? And inevitably, there's a a lightning that happens there. You, you feel ease. You, you start to describe joy. Inevitably, what you're going to talk about in that moment is, is a place of freedom. And so then the opportunity is to choose to live in that freedom. The opportunity is to then accept that. And so then we turn the thought around. We turn the thought around. He shouldn't have done that. He should have done that. Because part of it is we're arguing with reality, right? It's, it's interesting. It's like, that sky shouldn't be blue. Like, that's what we're really saying when we say they shouldn't have done. It happened. It happened. So to say they shouldn't have done that is arguing with reality, which, again, is just going to put you in a place of angst and, and not feeling good. So, okay, it happened. And so if we say he should have done that, right, then we can look for what are the reasons that that's true. Because maybe that person was in fear and they were believing something and they thought they had to be defensive. So based on what they were thinking, based on what they were believing, what else could they have done in that moment? Right. We understand that. But then, of course, you know, in in interactions like that, they shouldn't have done that. Well, then you also got to look at um, how the how the situation unfolded. And you could say, I shouldn't have done that. Because, of course, without fail because life is a mirror and we are co-creating, right? If someone is doing or saying something to me that they shouldn't have done, I also know that I was also, I had to have been in a defensive place myself. So if I say I shouldn't have done that, then I gotta look at what was I thinking? What was I thinking to be real that caused me to be defensive, that put up a wall that they then saw the wall and was like, oh, they putting up a wall? Let me tear it down, right? And so then we begin to through that turning around, we then begin to, to choose again and we create some ease um, and then we're actually able to choose, make that choice between weakness and the strength of Christ in us. So I talked about the work and again, please go back to the series. We did the series um, Free Your Mind is the most recent series we did on the work and then we just did a series titled The Work, um, Four Questions That Can Change Your Life. But ultimately, how do we move out of knee-jerk defensiveness and defensive behavior? And A Course in Miracles is very clear. Two words. Choose again. In the text, we read this. The saviors of the world 
who see like him are merely those who chose his strength instead of their own weakness seen apart from him. Learn then the happy habit of response to all temptation to perceive yourself as weak and miserable with these words. I am as God created me. His, his child can suffer nothing and I am his child. Now I, I'm using child instead of son so that we can include everyone. I am as God created me. His child can suffer nothing and I am his child. In that moment when you're feeling that angst, in that moment where you're feeling threatened, in that moment when you're feeling defensive, know that you have the opportunity right then and there to choose again. Know that right then and there, and it will come to you after hearing this, this sermon, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm at the crossroads. And even if, because Lord knows we do it, you choose <laughs> the path of defensiveness, you can erase all of that by choosing again. When you come back to yourself and say, wait a minute, I am as God created me. God's child can suffer nothing, nothing, nothing. I can't be threatened. I can't be threatened. I am God's child. And I love this idea that we read in the text, and, and I'm closing here. Learn then the happy habit of response to all temptation to perceive yourself as weak and miserable with these words. This, this takes us into the idea when we're thinking about uh, 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 sinlessness and when we hear even the words of the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into the temptation to perceive ourselves as weak. Lead us not into the temptation to perceive ourselves as powerful, powerless. Lead us not into the temptation to perceive ourselves as victims. Lead us not into the temptation to perceive ourselves as lacking. Lead us not into the temptation to perceive ourselves as poor. Lead us not into the temptation to perceive ourselves as the the 99% and the 1% has more than us. Lead us not into temptation of believing these lies about ourselves lead us not into temptation of believing that we are weak and we have no strength let us put an end to the childish games of defensiveness and let's live in the safety of defenselessness with that I invite everybody to stand and we take a deep breath in and we exhale right here and right now God is Right here and right now, love is. Right here, right now, peace is. Right here, right now, strength is. These are just some attributes of the all that is that you are, Mother, Father, God. And I recognize that as you are omnipresent substance, you are everywhere at all times, ready, willing, and able to become the thing that we desire through the mold of our thoughts. I recognize and remember right here and right now that you are divine intelligence. I recognize and remember right here and right now that you are the blue of the sky. I recognize and remember right here and right now you are the light of the sun that shines above the clouds. I recognize that you right here and right now are the drops of rain, the free liquid from the sky that is falling down here in Brooklyn. I recognize that you are all of these things and so much more. And I recognize that I am one with you, unified forever with you. I recognize that I remain as you created me. I am your child. I can suffer nothing. And as I recognize this truth of myself, I know it is the same truth of each and every one of my sisters and brothers that are here and within the sound of my voice. My sister, my brother, you remain as God created you. Nothing can threaten you. My sister, my brother, you are God's child. Nothing can threaten you. My sister, my brother, you remain as God created you. You can suffer nothing. My sister, my brother, you remain as God created you. You, you shall want for nothing. My sister, my brother, you, you are remain as God created you. You can fear for no thing. I stand in this absolute knowingness that this is the truth of all life. It is the truth of every cell. It is the truth of every atom. It is the truth of every blade of grass. It is the truth of every grain of sand. It is the truth of every human being. It is the truth of every animal and every insect and every flower and every planet and every moon and every star and every galaxy. This truth remains the truth throughout all life, seen and unseen. And so as I recognize that this is the truth of all life, I choose now to accept this good. I choose now to accept this good that the Christ lives within us. 
I choose to accept this good right now that there is a knower within us that knows that we are already victorious. I choose to accept this good right now that there is a knower within us that knows that we are abundant right now. I choose to accept this truth within us, this knower, this truth within us that knows that we are bigger than any problem and bigger than any circumstance. I choose to accept this good. I choose to accept this knowing. I choose to accept this consciousness, this consciousness within us that speaks to the mountain and says, mountain, be moved. Mountain, get out of our way. I choose to accept this knowingness. I choose to accept this consciousness. I choose to accept this truth, this truth that says, that we are prosperous now. I choose to accept this truth. I choose to accept this knowing. I choose to accept this good that says we can be, we can do, we can have anything that we desire easily and effortlessly. I choose to accept this truth. I choose to accept this knowing. I choose to accept this consciousness that reminds us over and over again that we are as God created us, perfect, whole, and complete. And so from this awareness of our perfection, I now release this prayer. I now release it back into the law, which is always in operation, responding to us easily and effortlessly. I let it be. I let it be. I let it be. And together we lift up our voices and we say, amen. amen. Ashe. Ashe. And so it is. And so it is. Thank you, God. 